Welcome. Good morning, everyone. We are honored that you decided to spend part of your weekend here That's with right. us. Mm -hmm. We have a great service planned for you. Today, we're going to teach you how to read the Bible. Mm -hmm. And it's not just read the Bible. It's actually read the Bible well or effectively. Mm -hmm. Because if we're just honest with ourselves, we normally just don't spend enough time to really understand exactly what God is trying to tell us. We, we read through it quickly. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you've done like me in the past. Uh, I open up the Bible to a random place and you say, God, what do you want to speak to me today about? Mm -hmm. And the first thing you read is... Judas hangs himself. <laughs> so, true. so how do you make sense of that? Do you actually say, is this God's word for me today? <laughs> I so need this class, so I hope to see you all online in this course. Today's online experience is designed specifically with you in mind. But whether you choose to say online or meet with us in person again, we will be meeting on March 19th, Friday, 11 o'clock, back at the fridge. It's going to be an, another amazing experience, whether online or in person. We're just so happy that you're with us. We definitely are. And another exciting thing that's coming up on March 26th, we're going to have our Easter extravaganza. Yeah. So much fun. It's going to be an Easter egg hunt in the desert for the kids. We're going to have our egg Olympics, some egg toss, and some Everything Easter egg, egg yes. decorating. It's going to be a great experience for the whole entire family. We can't wait to see you. Be on the lookout for upcoming announcements about it mm -hmm. because we're, as a staff, we're still trying to decide how many people are going to be allowed to come because of the COVID restrictions in place. That's right. And today, since we're speaking about uh, how to read the Bible effectively, we know that the Bible is, is God's written word for us. So what a better way to remind ourselves of who God says He is in His word with the song, Man of His Word, to be led by our worship leaders, Charles and OJ. And we know that God is the God who keeps His promises. So take it away, guys. Amen.
Well, thank you, OJ and Charles. That was a song from Maverick City Music, one of my favorite bands at the moment. Beautiful. Well, today we're in for a treat. Ed and Cindy Whitnell, an amazing couple in our Mosaic family, will bring their years of experience and passion for teaching the Bible in this course, How to Read the Bible Effectively. I remember Ed sharing with us some time ago that he's actually a better a husband, a better father, and a friend when he teaches the Bible. <laughs> wow, so Cindy, be on the lookout for a really good husband. Hey. Yeah, it's going to be good. Uh, today, we're going to hear just from Ed, mm -hmm. but in the class itself, we're going to hear from both they, Ed both of, and yeah, Cindy. Both of them. So mm -hmm. at this time, I'm going to hand it over to Ed. Good morning, and again, welcome to Mosaic. My name is Ed, and I'm one of the small group leaders here. I'm really excited to get to speak with you today about the Bible. The reason that I'm going to talk to you about this is to give you a taste of what we're going to be discussing in a small group that we're going to be hosting here at our house. We're going to talk about how to read the Bible effectively. Notice that it isn't just how to read the Bible, but how to do it effectively. But before we begin, please join me as we open with prayer. Father God, we just come before you humbly today seeking your guidance, your spirit, Lord. Prepare our hearts for the word that you have. And Lord, let all that we say and do today and this week bring glory and honor to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, what's the difference? What's the difference between reading the Bible and reading the Bible effectively? I want you to join me way back in the Stone Age when I was a child in the fifth grade. I made good grades, and, and honestly, I didn't try that hard. I did, however, hate listening to instructions. I hated slowing down. I was always going 150 kilometers an hour. One day, Mr. Kelly, my fifth grade teacher, he gave us a math quiz saying, read the instructions, complete the worksheet, then you can have free time. I knocked out the 10 questions, knowing I got them right, and then I proceeded to have free time. So a little while after that, when we went to grade the quiz, I failed and I hadn't missed one math question. So why did I fail? Because I didn't listen effectively. And more importantly, I didn't effectively read the instructions. The instructions stated, and I'm paraphrasing here, do not answer the questions. Turn the sheet over and draw for 15 minutes. If you answer the questions, you will fail the quiz. I'm embarrassed to say that I think I was the only kid in my class that didn't effectively read the instructions. So applying that to our topic today, how do we effectively read the Bible? 
Three steps, observation, interpretation, and application. Drawing a parallel, I want to illustrate a beloved verse that many of us know and demonstrate how we sometimes don't always properly understand the Bible. That's you, me, all of us, because we don't always read the Bible effectively. The verse is Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. This is an incredibly comforting statement from an obviously personal God. And yet, while it makes us feel good, it's not about you. And it's not about me. If we effectively read this verse, observing, interpreting, and applying it, we will come down firmly understanding that this verse applies to the Old Testament Jews who were in exile in Babylon for 70 years. I'm not going to explain why here, but you can trust me that we would delve deeply into it during our small group time. And if you don't want to trust me, you can go read the three preceding verses, and I, I think you'll understand why we came down with that conclusion. Now, taking a few steps back, foundationally, we should ask ourselves, why does reading the Bible matter? If you're not a Christian, first, I'm glad that you're here, and I, I really hope you'll come back and join us. But if you're not a Christian, maybe reading the Bible doesn't matter to you at all. If you're curious about Christianity, then, then it should matter to you. And if you are a Christian, it, it definitely matters to you, or it, or it definitely should matter to you. Because as Christians, we believe that the Bible is God's love letter to us. It reveals His nature and His character, and it's given to us so that we can know Him more deeply. Now let's give a little bit of historical context to the book that we call the Bible. The word Bible comes from the Latin word biblios, meaning book. So in Latin, the Bible was simply the book. But the Bible is so much more than just a book. I mean, practically speaking, the Bible is actually a collection of 66 books. Those books were written by 40-some-odd authors over a span of 1,500 years. The authors of the Bible were religious leaders, prophets, doctors, servants, and kings. And despite all of these varied lenses, there is still a unified single story throughout the Bible. How is that? Well, because despite all of those human authors, we believe that God is ultimately the author of the Bible, revealing Himself to us so that we might know Him better. Ultimately, the Bible is the story of God choosing to step into our lives and His choice to redeem us through Jesus Christ. From start to finish, that is the single story of the Bible. Now, scholars tend to divide the Bible into types of literature or genres. And there are seven of them. Narrative history, law, poetry, proverbs, prophecy, parables, and epistles. More generally, for me anyway, it's largely thought of as the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament tells us about God calling and forming the nation of Israel, and then the rise and the fall of Israel, particularly as they walked away from God, but ultimately His promise to redeem Israel and all of His people through a promised Savior. The New Testament presents us with Jesus of Nazareth. He was that promised Redeemer of Israel and the world. The Gospels end with Jesus' death on the cross for our sins and his res resurrection, ultimately demonstrating His power over sin and death. Now, the balance of the New Testament speaks to the growth of the early Christian church and the men and women that God used to accomplish that, all of which ultimately points right back to Jesus. The Bible as we know it in its current form came together around the 5th century and maybe 400 years ago, the King James Version, which so many of us knew growing up, was first printed in English. Today, there are literally hundreds of translations and paraphrases of the Bible, 
You can scroll through your YouVersion app on your phone, or you can Google Bible translations, and you can just find a, a taste of, of what's available. But now that we've talked a bit about the Bible itself and what it is, let's get back to how we can read the Bible effectively. Earlier, I mentioned observation, interpretation, and application. Now, in the small group that we're starting, we would spend an entire session on each one of those. But for today, I just want to give you a, a brief overview of all three of them. Now, before we go there, I, I do want to take a break here and say that God reveals Himself to us in the Bible. And I'm primarily speaking to Christians here, but we can never forget the role that God plays in revealing Himself to us through the Spirit. So we need to prayerfully approach the Word if we're going to read it effectively. Before, during, and after reading the Bible, we should be speaking with our Heavenly Father. Now, back to observation, interpretation, and application. Observation can be defined as the faculty or habit of closely and attentively perceiving one or more things about someone or something. In this case, what do I see? To really observe something, we kind of have to put on our detective hats and start asking questions based on what we read. This really is the foundation for the next two principles. So that second principle, interpretation, is about figuring out the author's original intent for the verse. Not everything we read in the Bible is about me or about you. As I mentioned with Jeremiah 29.11, sometimes it's recorded to teach us something, but it may not be directly about us. To effectively interpret the Bible, and with the help of the Holy Spirit, the phrase to remember is context is king. Locations, the culture, the events of the day, as well as what comes before and after a verse or, or verses, really informs the context. And then from that context, we can interpret. So finally, we have application. Application is a behavior that reflects life change or an experience that brings us closer to God. I would argue that application is the most important of these three. Whereas the first two steps help us to gather facts and context and information, if we do nothing with those, we have nothing to show for them. If we observe and interpret like champions, but we fail to apply what we learned, we simply grow no closer to God. We're filled with knowledge, but not with wisdom. So those are the, the three steps to effective Bible reading. Observation, interpretation, and application. So as a small sampling of, of what we're going to learn in this Reading the Bible small group, I'd like to spend a little bit of time here unpacking observation a little bit more. So again, we absolutely want to approach this prayerfully. But we put on our detective hats, we pick up our magnifying glasses, and we simply pour over the Scripture. What does it say? What doesn't it say? And don't, don't rush this. Really settle into this. The more time we spend in observation, the less time we end up spending on interpretation. So first things first. What type of literature am I reading? I mentioned the genres before. Narrative history, law, poetry, proverbs, prophecy, parables, and epistles. History. History gives us a summary of accounts of people and events. About 40% of the Old Testament is narrative history. Much of the Gospels are also narrative history. And with biblical narrative history, it tells us a story, but we have to be aware that it doesn't record every detail in a given situation. Now, when it does, we should pay attention. The second kind, law. Law is a set of instructions given to Israel by God. So if you know the Bible, you know which books we're talking about, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, most of the early books in the Old Testament. These books provide moral, social, and civil norms, or laws, that apply to the Jews. The third genre is poetry. Poetry, in a, in a biblical sense, or songs or poems, 
that are written to either express the emotions of God's people or to praise God Himself. Psalms is the longest book in the Bible and certainly contains the most poetry, but other examples are Lamentations or the Song of Solomon. Now, I think that we should stop a second and talk about these emotions that are expressed to God. In some churches today, there is a, a false doctrine that's taught that if we're God followers, everything is going to work out. Everything's going to be great. While that is true ultimately, it isn't true for our lives day to day. Jesus himself tells us, in this world, you will have trouble. And if you spend any time in the poetry books of the Bible, you will see God's people and their emotions. You will see them express joy and happiness. <laughs> but you'll also read anger and fear and frustration. Our God is so personal that He wants to know how we feel, the good stuff and the bad stuff. And thankfully, He is strong enough to handle any emotion that we can give Him. Now getting back to the types of books, the genres, the next that we have is Proverbs. And as you can guess from the name, Proverbs give us God's wisdom about more skillful or better living. These are principles in large part as opposed to pure promises that exist elsewhere in the Bible. They aim to teach us something without addressing every possible circumstance. Next, we have prophecy. Now, prophecy is kind of a churchy word, but biblically speaking, prophecy is writing that uses symbolic language to reveal a message from God that was previously unknown. The latter part of the Old Testament, the Minor Prophets, as well as Revelation, are examples of prophetic books. And then next we have parables. Parables are stories that are told to illustrate a spiritual or a moral concept. And examples of parables are found in all three of the first Gospels. And finally, the last type of literature or genre that we find in the Bible are epistles. And again, that's kind of a churchy word, epistle, but it simply means letters. They were letters that were sent either to an individual or to a group of people. There are 21 epistles in the New Testament, and Paul wrote 13 of those. Observing why an epistle was written is a key step to any general understanding of that letter. Now, in our small group, we would spend some time identifying examples of each one of these types of literature, genres. But in the interest of moving on, we would summarize by saying that the first step of observation is identifying the type of literature that we're reading. So, step one, identify the genre that we're reading. This gives us a solid foundation from which to move ahead to the next step. The second step is to start asking journalistic questions. These are the who, what, when, where, how, why questions. Why do we ask these questions? These questions, they help us gain more context as we observe. I'll give you an example. If you're reading one of Paul's letters in the New Testament, it seems logical that we would ask, who is Paul addressing in the letter? Typically in Paul's epistles, the name of the book, as well as the first chapter, give us pretty good insight into the who question. In many of Paul's epistles, he addressed multiple subjects. So we can home in on what subject is Paul addressing in a given verse or verses. And then from there, we can ask, why is Paul addressing this subject in the first place? Going back to something I mentioned earlier, don't rush through these questions. Observation sets the tone for interpretation and application. So spend time asking these questions and others. So then the, the third and final step in observation is to ask literary questions about the text. The first literary question is what are the key words? Here's a quick side note that I learned from my preacher growing up. Pay attention to the transition words. If the verse you're studying begins with for or therefore or because of, your context gathering and observation needs to put it in reverse and go see what the author was talking about before 
the therefore. Another question to ask is, what is the mood or the, the atmosphere of the text? Is the author relaxing and relating, or is he running for his life? Is the author happy or angry or frustrated? Again, the mood helps us to gather more clues before we move on to interpretation and application. So in summary, for observation, number one, we identify the genre of the text. Is it wisdom, or prophecy, or narrative history? Number two, we have to understand the setting. We have to ask who, what, when, why, and how questions. And third, we have to discover the emphasis. We have to look for the key words and the key phrases and the mood of the text. So, once we have prayerfully read the text and spent time answering these questions, we should have a good feel for the context of the verse. With that in hand, we should be well prepared to move on to interpretation. Together, these three disciplines put us on a solid foundation for effectively reading the Bible. I hope that this has been interesting and helpful for you. And if you're interested, we will be hosting a, a four-week small group study, either virtually or live, depending on the COVID situation, where we will explore each of these steps to effective Bible reading in the near future. So, with that, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, Ed, for a clear explanation on the first step of yes. how to read the Bible effectively. We have a few more steps that you're going to learn in the class. It's going to be amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, I just love how reading the Bible connects us with God. God loved us so much that He wanted to show Himself to us. So He gave us the Bible to learn more about Him and experience Him. If you'd like to be part of this course, make sure you type in yes in the comments and we'll make sure that you are registered for this class. I can't wait to join this class online with you all. Yeah, it's going to be amazing. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for joining us this weekend. We hope you have a great rest of it. Yes. Um, if you haven't done it yet, go ahead and click on subscribe. That will let you know every single time we put out another helpful video. All right. Have a great weekend. Have thanks a weekend, for being everyone. here with us. Take care. God bless.